great. Glad you came back. Uh, Ellie Zay will be introducing her speaker tonight, but I just want to welcome you all here. Thanks for coming to the annual Winget Lectures. And we have representatives of the Winget family, Morris and Yalua Adin Weigel. Does that correct? Please stand up and give them thanks. They're the ones who make this possible. Going, I said that if you came back tonight, we're giving away uh, Dr. Keener's bestseller, uh, the NIV Bible Background Commenter. But you have to, there's a quiz. Oh, what did I say? NIV, no, it's IVP, University Press. <laughs> NIV something. <laughs> okay. So here's a question. No. No professor's name. <laughs> No theology students may answer. No ministry students may answer. We, we want to make sure that non ministry students start reading the Bible. <laughs> We'd rather read the Bible for our ministry so here's the question, right? So, uh, I'll put it. Here it is. What community, what group in this community was Jesus referring to? They lived in the desert in Qumran. Does anyone know the answer to this question? Okay. You have your hand up. You're the only one. What's the answer? The Essenes, she's correct. She's correct. Why don't you say this to you? Are you going to stand in peace? Were you? She's going to try. I just want to slow. Well, in any case, uh, Ellie's A is here to introduce the speaker that we Thank you. I just want to start with a uh, short personal testimony. Uh, how I first met Dr. Keener. Uh, it was in 2009, I was a graduate student at Wheaton College Graduate School, and he came to speak on the same subject of miracles. Uh, before that, I received a couple of his books, and uh, so I, I knew about him, but uh, that was it. So after he, um, his, um, he came to speak with to Wheaton, I, I met with him, and we, we talked a little bit, and we got to read us um, that there were so many uh, stories that we will share. Uh, so we sat down the next day and I shared my testimony with him and that's how I was um, happily surprised in the end to realize that he did include that story uh, in his two volume commentary that he will be talking about um, miracles, the credibility of the New Testament accounts. Um, so that's how our friendship began and I am just pleased now tonight uh, to um, introduce him, uh, Dr. Craig Keener. Uh, is uh, a new, well, I cannot read the whole long title about, um, so I would just say he is Professor of New Testament at Asbury Theological Seminary, and uh, he is uh, especially known, as uh, Ken said, um, through his uh, background commentary of New Testament, for which it is also an Old Testament version, and he has published, I think we should say now, more than 20 books, because uh, this biography I have, I have here dates back to maybe three or four years, and every year there is one or two books that um, are published, and I believe he has just finished his fourth volume um, on the Book of Acts, and which you heard about for those of you who were here um, earlier um, today. Um, he has published, or I'll just tell you all, uh, his publications. Uh, he has traveled extensively uh, around the world, uh, speaking on different campuses, churches, and pastors uh, as part of his uh, uh, ministry. And he is an ordained, ordained minister in African American church, and he was in pastoral ministry for many, many years. Uh, and he moved to Asbury. 
a few years ago. I will just share with you before I finish uh, that Dr. Keener's interest is not just about academic uh, and background issues, he, he is also very much interested in foreground issues about the future. I discovered just um, this morning his last publication that maybe many of you may not be aware of. Uh, but let me ask you, how many know about uh, this uh, doctrine of the rapture? Okay, the church being taken away to heaven to be caught up with um, Jesus. So I discovered that his last publication um, came uh, on April 24 of this year, and the title was Rapture Helmets. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read you the title and subtitle, Rapture Helmets now available at discounted price in case you are inside the building when the rapture takes place, <laughs> only $12.95, but no deferred payments in, um, into the millennium, a uh, special sale after the start of the Great Tribulation. <laughs> also available, it's not done, uh, rapture proof insurance in case you damage your roof by ex exiting during the rapture. Tribulation damage insurance not included. <laughs> www.craigkinner.com to order your helmet and rupture your helmet. Disclaimer, no theology intended here except perhaps a swipe at questionable fundraising techniques. <laughs> Let's welcome Dr. Craig Kinner. Yeah, actually, I have I have some uh, cartoons that are supposed to be funny on my website because I I fall behind in writing blogs and so I stick the cartoons in too. Anyway, uh, and, and I do have to warn you that there are some people who don't think the Essenes are actually the ones who wrote the Dead Scrolls. So give me a look. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the Essenes. So you 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 are good. Your Majesty, we praise you for your greatness and your love. You are the one who lavishes your signs upon us. And, and God, we, we give you the credit, we acknowledge that you're the one who does it. We give you the glory. And we pray that you will be glorified and you alone and everything to mind. In the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're looking at miracle reports. And the way I started with this was, actually it was going to be a footnote for my Acts commentary. <laughs> and, and I just, you know, people, they come up with these objections. They say, well, you know, the source is not reliable. We can't trust the Gospels because the Gospels report miracles, and we can't believe in miracles. And therefore, we can't believe when the Miracles report gospel, uh, when the Gospels report miracles because the Gospels the miracle reports, and we can believe miracles. So, uh, there, there were a couple responses I had to that. One is the Gospels are ancient biographies. And ancient biographies, well, I, I've worked through a number of ancient biographies, and they, they stick very closely to their sources. Um, but another issue was the issue of the miracle stories themselves. About one third of Mark's Gospel, or about 20% of the book of Acts, consists of miracle stories or exorcisms. So it's a pretty big issue in the New Testament. And when I, when I um, therefore was writing the Acts commentary, I was just going to have a footnote where the people would say, well, we know that miracles um, don't happen, and therefore these things must have arisen by legendary accretion. Uh, eyewitnesses never claim these things. And if eyewitnesses ever claim these things, we'd have eyewitnesses claiming these things today. I'm like, what world have we been in? Eyewitnesses do claim these things today. So um, I started writing the footnote, and I was just looking for a few books catalog a bunch of these accounts, and initially I didn't find very, very many, so the footnote just kept getting longer and longer as I was putting different things I was finding. After about 200 pages, the publisher agreed with me that probably it should be a separate book. <laughs> and after 1,100 pages, they finally published it because it was going to keep getting longer, and they didn't. So uh, David Friedrich Strauss, you may have heard of in the 1800s, he said that 
Um, he, he's actually the one who said that a lot of things in the Gospels are not trustworthy because these arose by, by legendary accretion. And uh, mainly because of miracles. He said this, this stuff is mythical. I would just don't claim this. Unfortunately for Strauss, Strauss had a friend named Edward Morica who had a diagnosed spinal problem and, and was unable to walk. Well, Strauss spent some time with the German Lutheran pastor, Johann Christoph Wurmhardt, who was known for the Ministry of Healing and Exorcism in the 1800s. And Strauss's friend was cured. And, and Strauss said, well, maybe my friend was just psychosomatically unable to walk, despite his medical diagnosis. But he did not say that the report of his friend's healing came merely by legendary accretion. Are there credible eyewitness reports today? Well, we have quite a lot of them, and we have medical sources included in that. Dr. Rex Gardner wrote a book called Healing Miracles. And one of the accounts in the book, he has a number of accounts in the book, obviously, but one of the accounts is of a nine-year-old girl, deaf without her hearing aid, but she was praying for healing. She'd just been tested the week before, uh, and the reason that she couldn't hear was due to auditory nerve damage. It's clearly an organic problem. It's not something that normally goes away of its own. <clears throat> she was instantly and completely healed. Her parents called the audiologist. He denied that this was possible. He tested her and said, I have no explanation for this, but her hearing has been completely restored. There are eyewitnesses, some of whom I know, who report the healings of deaf non-Christians in Jesus' name in Mozambique which has led to massive church growth, is, is they go into these villages um, that have no church. They, they, they uh, show the Jesus film, they pray for the sick, and massive numbers of people get healed, uh, especially deafness, many of blindness, and other, other things. Uh, people in the village know them, so the next day, the church gets started in the village. And this has caused uh, just massive church growth. And, uh, one, one region, actually, that was um, on record as being a certain religion the government has now reclassified the region as predominantly now Christian region. Southern Medical Journal, in September of 2010, actually published a study of what was going on there. It was very remarkable, uh, with people going from blindness and deafness to uh, um, seeing and hearing. And, of course, as you can imagine, the feedback on the internet uh, included some, um, some criticism. And one of the criticisms was fairly legitimate criticism, namely that testing conditions in rural Mozambique are not ideal. It's true. But Candy Gunther Brown, one of the authors of the study, published a book called Testing Prayer at Harvard University Press in 2012. And in one of the chapters in that book, she she details the circumstances of the study. And I think after reading the chapter, you know, she doesn't come out and say these were miracles, but I think after reading them, that would be her conclusion. Because this was, I mean, the people actually did go from blindness to seeing, and deafness to hearing, and so on. <clears throat> we have a, a number of other cases. This is a, this is a case that was documented a number of years ago, this was Lisa Larios. She was dying of a degenerative bone disease. She was unable to walk. She was in a wheelchair. Her parents hadn't told her she was dying, but they took her to a healing crusade. Whatever you think of healing crusades, in this case, nobody actually got to lay hands on her. Nobody actually even got to pray for her. Um, but in the, in the midst of this atmosphere, as people were being prayed for, she suddenly jumped out of her wheelchair and began running around. And the testing afterwards showed that not only did she no longer have the disease, but her bones that had degenerated now had been restored. Again, that's something that doesn't happen on its own. Bruce Fennata, uh, he was crushed under a semi-truck. <clears throat> Most of his small intestine was destroyed, and after several surgeries, he didn't have very much left. He had less than a quarter of his small intestine left, which wasn't enough for him to be able to survive on. He was rapidly losing weight. When one of his friends from New York felt led to fly to Wisconsin and pray for him, 
and actually commanded his small intestine to grow in Jesus' name. He felt something like an electric jolt through him. And the medical tests afterwards, this is all documented, now show that his, uh, what happened after that was his, his small intestine had grown to about half the normal length. Now that's not full length, but that is more than double what it was before. And, and now it was adequate it was enough for him to, to survive on. Um, so you hear people say, well, how come you never hear of an amputated appendage growing back? This is the equivalent of an amputated appendage growing back. The small intestine um, in an adult doesn't, doesn't grow in length. I'm going to skip a, a few of these. Um, Carl Cockerell, this was in, uh, in Michigan. Well, actually, he was in Missouri when it happened, but he's from Michigan. So I thought it was like a Michigan story, right? Um, but Carl Cockerell was uh, visiting Branson, Missouri, and he he was, he was about 65. Uh, he'd, he'd been a runner all his life, but he uh, he stepped down the wrong way and he he broke his ankle, um, and it was so bad he passed out. But they uh, they took him to the hospital. The doctor kept him overnight, uh, put him in a cast, uh, and said, well, you can go back to, <clears throat> to your doctor in Michigan uh, if that's what you want to do. But you, know, you need to stay in this cast and then consult with your doctor there. So um, he had the, the, the results. They told him that his, his ankle was broken. And actually, uh, that night, though, when he was in the hospital, he felt that the Lord spoke to him clearly. And so he got to he got back to Michigan, consulted with his doctor, and took some new X-rays. And the doctor showed him the new X-rays. And in front of the new X-rays, the new radiology report, he said, "Not only do you not have a broken ankle, you never had a broken ankle." So he showed him the first radiology report. He said, uh, uh, "That's a broken ankle." <laughs> Joy Waterford was a student at Taylor University. She had a classic case of vertical hemorrhoid. So classic, in fact that it was her picture that was used in the pamphlet that advertised the nature of the condition. So uh, it was, you know, caused a lot of problems with uh, migraines that sometimes last for a week and things like that. Uh, although it was especially uh, the way her, her eyes were uh, and she required special glasses and she had problems with her vision. Well, a, a friend was praying for a prayer group there at, at Taylor University and she was instantly and completely healed. And she went back to the eye doctor, and the eye doctor didn't think it was a miracle because she didn't do miracles, if I understand the account correctly. But um, what Joy told me was, well, she said, have you ever seen this before? And the doctor said, no. Out of thousands of cases of vertical hemorrhoria, I've never, ever seen something like this happen. So uh, she, Turns out she now has 2020 vision. She had to get the documentation for that so that she could um, get a regular driver's license without without visual impairment, not because she had 2020 vision. And um, she she was completely healed. I'm going to skip some others of these. Uh, the Catholic Church has been very meticulous in supplying medical documentation for miracles at, at Word and elsewhere. I have to be careful when I say something in French. Anyway, the eyewitness testimony is also a form of evidence in sociology, anthropology, journalism, and of course historiography. We would be in trouble in most of those disciplines, or all those disciplines, without it. So I'm going to give some examples of that as well. Um, from my interviews or published sources that I've made alive, and all this, I'm just giving samples for the sake of time. You even look at those samples going to collect more. But one principle that I'm following is that a smaller number of eyewitnesses counts more heavily than a greater number of skeptical non-eyewitnesses. What I mean by that is, like, <clears throat> the way we would apply it to most other kinds of claims. I mean, if a police officer comes along and is taking notes from witnesses of an accident, and the witnesses are, are supplying their accounts, and then somebody says, that's not what happened. I know that's not what happened. And the officer says, well, can you tell me what you saw? Well, I didn't see anything. I wasn't there. That's why I know it didn't happen. Normally, we would not take that as, as a reliable testimony. 
Well, there are a lot of people who say, well, I've never seen these things, therefore I know they don't happen. That's, that's not a very helpful epistemic approach. Now, I, I, I want you to understand uh, that I'm, I'm, theologically, I'm not claiming that everybody who's prayed for gets healed. As you can see, I wear glasses, I have nail pattern balding, and my students have suggested that there are a few other things wrong with my head as well. <laughs> <clears throat> but, um, but we have a number of highly reliable eyewitnesses. And Hume, a few centuries ago, said we have no reliable eyewitnesses for miracles. So I just want to point out, actually, by the standards that Hume suggests, we do have a number, except that Hume wouldn't accept anybody as reliable if they said it's a miracle. But Wansuk and Julie Mott, Wansuk is the director of Oxford Center for Mission Studies. Uh, he and his wife, uh, who also is a professor there, they both have PhDs. They prayed for someone with a toxic goiter. The goiter instantly disappeared in the sight of many witnesses. Uh, and there are a number of other accounts of that. <clears throat> Luther O'Connor is a professor uh, or, or assistant professor at the United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. And he was praying for a woman in the Philippines with an unbendable metal implant in her leg. And after he prayed for her, she felt something in her leg. And she squatted down, now able to bend her leg. Now, whether the metal implant disappeared, I do not know. But if it was still there, it was now bendable. Danny McCain, and then he's, he's working on getting medical documentation for that. D D Danny McCain is a, is a really good friend of mine. I stayed with him for three summers in, uh, in northern Nigeria. And because so many of my friends from Africa had accounts of miracles, I thought I would ask Danny because he'd been living there for a long time. Instead, he gave me an account from the United States uh, from when he was a child growing up, uh, attending a Wesleyan church in Georgia. His, uh, his baby brother had been scalded all over so badly that when they tried to take the clothes off, it was carrying the skin. Uh, but after a while, they sent him home from the hospital because there was, there was nothing more they could do. It was just, they said it's going to take a long time. It's going to take weeks for this to heal. And they were, they were all praying. And suddenly he noticed his brother stopped crying. And he looked up, and he saw his brother crawling across the floor, his skin bright and pink, as if it had never been burned. My brother Chris, uh, who, who now has a PhD in physics, I'm just mentioning these things so you know he's a reliable witness. And by the way, Danny has a PhD as a New Testament professor. Of course, New Testament professors are particularly reliable. But anyway, <laughs> my, my, brother, my brother Chris, <laughs> what was that? Except Strauss, yeah, I do. Well, I think it was the theological stuff that got him. But my, my brother Chris and I witnessed uh, something. When, when, in 1983, I was a fairly young Christian, and we were helping out in a nursing home Bible study, a Rosalie nursing home. And there was a lady there named Barbara. Every week she said, I wish I could walk. I wish I could walk. And one week, the Bible study leader, Don, said, I'm sick of this. He was, he was a seminarian from Fuller. And uh, he, he walked over to you know, all the, he'd been absorbing all the stuff about uh, the kingdom from, from George Ladd's teaching and how the ways you're preaching the kingdom, the kingdom is demonstrated by signs and wonders. And so anyway, so he, he goes over to, to Barbara, grabs her by the hand, says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And I froze in terror. If, if faith is a bias, I cannot be accused of it, in this case, at least. Uh, because I thought she was going to fall on the floor. And, and the expression on Barbara's face was that of absolute horror as well. So if this was psychosomatic, it wasn't her psycho. Uh, <clears throat> he walked her around the room. And from then on, Barbara could walk. And from then on, she always said, I love my Bible study. I love my Bible study. <laughs> I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on some particular kinds of issues. 
Um, first of all, field blindness. I found about 350 reports of pure blindness. Now keep in mind that, you know, uh, it's, it's a small proportion of, of the people who actually are blind. It's not like most blind people were getting healed. But still, quite a number of blind people were healed. Rex Gardner has some accounts of that in his book. Um, Clint McLaughlin, who is a friend of mine, he's uh, director of the Transforming Business Institute at Cambridge. In 2004, he prayed for a blind man in northern India, and the, the man had clouded eyes, so presumably he had cataracts, which normally can be removed only surgically. For an immediate dissolution of the meninges. <clears throat> this is the field where the man ran in circles praising God after he was healed. And this is where he, he gave his testimony to uh, an audience there for, for being healed. And he began to weep. And they asked him, Why are you weeping? He said, Because I've always heard the sound of children, but I've never seen them. And this is with some other people who also were witnesses of the, of the event. Dr. Dr. Kato, Bolshevako Kato, is the president of Shalom University in uh, Congo DRC. And I believe it, uh, uh, Dr. Uwaba knows him as well. <coughs> but um, I, we were just talking about ethnic reconciliation kind of issues. And I asked him, well, did you ever uh, did you ever see any visible miracles? He said, oh, well, yeah. Years ago, when I was doing evangelism out in the village with some friends of mine, they brought us a woman who was blind. And they tried medicine. They tried traditional healers. Nothing had worked. So now they brought her to us and said, can you do anything? And Dr. Kato said, well, we've never done anything like this before. But we said, well, we came and the Lord's name might be glorified. So let's just pray and see what God might do. And they prayed. And after about two minutes, she started screaming. This lady in the 60s started jumping around, crying out, I can see, I can see. And she remained sighted for the rest of her life. Um, one of my students prayed for a man who was blind. The man's uh, eyesight was instantly restored. That was testified to both by him and one of my other students, Gabriel Bolden Hessen from Ethiopia. But we're going to go on to Greg Spencer. <coughs> Greg Spencer is uh, an American example. He was suffering from macular degeneration. By the way, the medical documentation, the way we're supposed to do it, was supposed to block out the, the names. Uh, but I have the original with me in them. But Greg Spencer was uh, suffering from macular degeneration. He was legally blind. He had already been registered with the government for his support. Um, and then one day he went to a retreat for the healing of the mind. Uh, I think it was a charismatic retreat, but it wasn't he wasn't even praying for the healing of his eyesight, he was praying for the healing of his mind. And God did heal his mind. But at the same time, he opened his eyes and suddenly he could see. And, and he, he went back, uh, he went outside and he could see everything. And, uh, you know, it's all medically documented. He had a remarkable return of his visual acuity. He, he went from being blind to being able to see. And the, uh, there was one drawback to this, and that was the report from the Social Security Administration. They spent a year checking into it, saying there, this must be fraud. This doesn't go away on its own. And after a year of research, they concluded, no, he just experienced a remarkable return of his visual acuity. And therefore, he no longer qualified for Social Security disability. He had to go back to work. <laughs> so I'm going to give some accounts now of raising from the dead. Now, in most of these cases, we can't tell how dead a person was. They were just a little dead and very, very good. <laughs> Um, we, we don't we don't have uh, means to test in most of these cases like how long uh, you know, if they were fully brain dead or whatever. But um, we do have a, a lot of cases of this. In some cases, they were you know, right there on the medical table. So in any case, these are again just some samples.
examples with, I consider them useful because usually people cannot be thought to be merely psychosomatically <laughs> um, Now, there are clusters of these accounts. So that when I started asking around, in my, my immediate circle of friends and my wife's immediate circle of friends, we had 10 eyewitness accounts of this happening, um, which if that's, if that's representative, and these are not miracles, uh, and merely people were really thought to be dead, and weren't really dead, then I think we could say from that that uh, an inordinate proportion of people are being buried prematurely. But uh, actually, I think the, the fact that they cluster in circles where people are praying for miracles can I mean, tell us something. Um, a number of these through church history, the reported the church fathers, Irenaeus talks about there being lots of these in his day. Um, John Wesley has one reported in his journal where Mr. Myrick had fallen sick and was, um, well, they both fell sick on December 15th. Wesley got better, Mr. Myrick. As far as anybody could tell, he was, he was dead uh, on December 25th. When Wesley and the others prayed for him, he, he uh, recovered and then uh, got better from there. There are a number of reports from doctors, I'm going to skip ahead to this one. Uh, Dr. Chauncey Crandall, the cardiologist at West Palm Beach, was making his rounds in the hospital uh, one day, I think it was on a Saturday, when they, they called him into the ER, basically to just call the car and say that this, this person who had come in, Jeff Markin, was dead. Uh, they had been trying to revive him for 40 minutes, and then flatlined for 40 minutes, and they followed all the American Heart Association protocols. Are, are you guys getting bored, by the way? Is it all right? <laughs> all right, so anyway. <laughs> they, um, so he just you know, signed the death certificate, went back to make his rounds and the rest of the hospital, but suddenly he felt the Holy Spirit check in and lead him to go back and pray for the man to have a second chance. Now this doesn't happen very often, obviously. But he went, he, he went back in, uh, one of his colleagues came in with him, the nurse was sponging down the the body for the, uh, to get ready for the morgue. I had not taken all the, all the um, attachments off yet. He, he, uh, he laid his hand on the man's head and said, Father, if you want this man to have another chance to know you, I pray that you will raise him from the dead. And the nurse glared at him like Dr. Crandall. You have lost your mind. He turned to his colleague and said, shock him with the paddle one more time. The colleague was like, you know, we agreed that there was no hope. Right? All right. Shock him with the paddle one more time. Immediately, heartbeat was normal. Now, that doesn't normally happen even after the flatline for a minute or two, right? At least those are very friendly for me. Um, and so the nurse started screaming, Dr. Crandall, Dr. Crandall, what have you done? <laughs> because, of course, after six minutes with no oxygen, you have irreparable brain damage setting in. And so, you know, Frankenstein's monster, right? So, uh, and, and his, I mean, his, his fingers already had cyanosis fingers had already begun turning black. So uh, this was a Saturday. He went in to see Jeff Markin on Monday. Jeff Markin was, was recovering fully. He had no brain damage. Uh, and he did have a second chance to meet God. And he did meet God. And this is a picture of Chauncey Crandall participating in Jeff Markin's baptism. Uh, um, Dr. Sean George was himself uh, a doctor. He, he, he was having a heart attack. Uh, he went into cardiac arrest in the hospital. They spent 55 minutes trying to revive him. All the medical documentation was there. Uh, his system started failing, so he had a deep kidney failure and so on. And in you know, 55 minutes trying to revive him, no, no way to revive him, so they said to his wife, just you need to say your goodbyes. And she, she knelt down beside him. And, and just pleaded with God to restore him. Immediately, the heartbeat went, came back. Uh, and the other doctors were like, oh no, this is the worst thing that can happen. Because he's going to have irreparable brain damage, and at some point, she's going to have to make a decision when to change the next support. But um, 
<clears throat> it did take three months before he was ready to go back to work, but he had no brain damage, and he's practicing regularly as a doctor again. De Deborah Watson was my colleague in Palmer Seminary. De Debbie uh, was one of the New Testament professors, like myself, and a reliable testament. Uh, but she, she put me in touch, especially with her father, who, who was a Baptist minister, who remembered the details better because she was a child in the South. Her little sister, Gloria, was the one uh, kneeling there. Gloria, uh, when she was a baby, she fell from a very high place. The back of her head hit concrete. And she was motionless. They didn't see any breathing or anything else. And her father, <clears throat> when, he tried to, when he picked up the child, and his, one of his hands was behind her head, it felt like her skull had been crushed in the back. And they, they heard the doctor. And they were just praying frantically. And when they when they got there, the doctor took took the child. And after a while, he came out and he said, where did you say you felt like your skull was crushed? And he came back in. And it felt like it was fully restored. And Lori was completely fine from, from that point on. No, no more uh, problem. There are a number of things like this in India. Uh, many, many places in India, but they can only give a sample. Uh, in one case, this is documented in a, in a dissertation on the, about the beginning of uh, the growth, the spreading of the gospel among the Nishi tribal people in Northeast India. There was a government official whose son was, was dying. Uh, I should talk faster. Um, too much material. <laughs> there was a government uh, official whose son was dying. And he didn't know what to do. And so he asked, um, he was talking to the pharmacist, because they tried medicines, they tried sacrificing the different deities. And the pharmacist said, well, you've tried everything else. Why do you try praying to Jesus, the Christian God? It said that he raised somebody in Lazarus from the dead. And so he went back. His son, by this point, was dead, as far as anybody could tell. He, he said, God, if you raise my son from the dead, I will become Christian. Now, this isn't something that's guaranteed to happen. There's no rule like this. But his son came back, and he was converted. And it was the beginning of a people movement among the Nishi tribal people that led to tens of thousands of people becoming Christians. Two Western sociologists write a book on global Pentecostalism. The, the sociologists themselves were Christians, but they were not Pentecostal. But, but uh, researching this book, University of Southern California Press, they interviewed some local witnesses in a couple places in India where there were reports of people being raised from the dead. And even, even Hindu witnesses and, and, and others recognized that these things had happened to the prayers of, of Christians. In one place, the local newspapers reported the story. In one case, the girl was probably fairly, pretty well dead. Worms were coming out of her nose and so on. Um, <clears throat> Pastor in Mumbai shared with me that they were on a, on a retreat, a retreat center, not a Christian retreat center, just a general retreat center, and they found a boy named Vikram lying at the bottom of a pool. He had, he had drowned, and the drowning cases are special kind of but in any case, they, they, uh, they got him from the bottom of the pool. They took him to the hospital. The doctor said, no, he's dead. There's nothing that can be done. Um, they took him to another doctor. That doctor tried to revive him, but couldn't do it. So they, while they were, uh, a couple of them were bonds, taking the boy to check on him at the, at the doctors. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the, the Christians, uh, the other Christians in the group were, were praying that God would help them. And an hour and a half later, he came back to Vikram. And all of these pictures are Vikram after he came back, um, alive and well. Now, even, even in the cases of, of cold water drowning, where you hear a person being able to be revived after a certain time, normally they're not ready to go back for a swim right afterwards. But Vikram was completely well. And this is uh, Vikram and his family uh, participating in a Christian's worship service. Vikram said that uh, he heard the name Jesus and then suddenly was rescued. His parents were Hindus, said he had never heard that name before. 
it's just just rendered in the Philippines. Let's skip this one for now. Um, this one's from Indonesia. Uh, it's a testimony from my neighbor. It's barely barely in the miracles book because I had just met him at that point. We just moved to Asbury at that point. But I have this picture here to remind me, to tell you that if you get queasy at the sight of blood, you need to close your eyes. Because uh, these were pictures of his friends taken from the evening news. Dominguez uh, obviously had his, his neck cut uh, in an attempt to kill him. This picture is actually that's gruesome. It's after the body had been moved. This is then carrying the body to the hospital from which he was to be sent to the morgue. Um, but he had an experience of heaven, out of body experience of heaven, came back into his body, and the, uh, the doctors were saying, okay, well, let's send him to the morgue, and he squeaked out, I'm not dead. <clears throat> the doctors were quite surprised, but they, they sewed his neck back. So he still has the scars to show for it, but he's he's not dead anymore. So it's a case for you. Required by the that you know, God works through various means. Thank God for the medical intervention. I think uh, that's certainly God's, God's work. Uh, just like Jesus fed the 5,000 uh, for a miracle, they had to gather up the fragments that remain because the next meal wouldn't need a miracle. God works to natural needs most of the time. But anyway, uh, I was reading some of these accounts at a scholars meeting, uh, secular, or, well, not everybody there was secular, but secular scholars meeting. And we were, <clears throat> I was talking about uh, maybe we could read the biblical accounts of miracles more sympathetically if we would take into account some of these accounts from the majority world because there are. Um, there are people there who actually use the, the gospel accounts as a ministry model, and maybe their way of reading the gospel accounts is closer to the way people in the first century would have read these accounts than the way we often read them today in the West. Well, at the end of my presentation, <coughs> Professor Ayo Adawuya stood up and uh, told us about his son, who was stillborn. And they prayed for about 30 minutes, and his son came back to life. And um, I, I was a PhD in New Testament professor at a school now in the U.S. from Nigeria. And his son had no brain damage. He now has a master of science degree from the University of London. And Ben Witherington, who was sitting to my right, uh, said something like, okay, hey, now we should do the benediction or something like that. It was, uh, well, Ben and I were tied to you on this one. But anyway, secular scholars meeting. Were surprised, but they were they were cool. My my friend Leo Bawa, once I started working on the miracles book and noticing that many of my friends in Africa had many stories, not all of them, but many of them. I said, Well, let me ask. You know, I, I worked with a couple of friends in Capro School of Missions when I was in in Nigeria. So let me just ask them if they have any stories. And Leo Bawa was one of my friends, he's doing a PhD now. And is this one? So we, Leo was, um, <coughs> I asked him if, if he had any miracle accounts. He said, well, just a few. So he sent me seven pages. And one of the accounts was of a friend of him, uh, well, not a friend of him. He was, he was doing ministry in the, in the village where um, the neighbors brought in their son who was, as far as anybody can tell, he's dead, and asked him to pray. And so he took the child aside, and after a couple hours, he said he handed, handed it back to his parents alive. Now, another of my friends at Capro, uh, Timothy Alonide, I hadn't even thought of asking him until some people said, oh, no, you need to ask him. I noticed the scar that he had, but I'd never known how he got it, and I never asked him. Well, Timothy had been in a car accident, Two people were killed, one of them was Timothy. Police found no pulse or heartbeat. Uh, they, they took him to the hospital, the hospital sent him to the morgue, and around 3 a.m., so about eight hours after they pronounced him dead, they found him moving in the mortuary. And uh, you're not supposed to do that if you're really there yet. So, <laughs> The, the, the doctor said, well, there's going to be severe brain damage. But after, 
he, it was an instant, but he did recover. After three weeks, he was released from the hospital, but he continued to be treated in the hospital a while. The, the surgeon, who was also a medical professor, um, said that his return to life and rapid recovery was beyond medical explanation. And all the, all the, um, the interns were saying, Doctor, this doesn't make sense. How do we explain this? He said, I told you, this is just a miracle. Just let it alone. Yep. So anyway, he's now a, a leader in the Nigerian missions movement. Pastor Andre Mamadzi in Cameroon, um, he, he, uh, he shared this with me. He's, he's the, uh, the pastor of one of my brothers-in-law. Uh, and uh, anyway, he was also introduced to me by, by the dean of the Evangelical Seminary there. But the, there was a girl who was brought into him. She had she'd been pronounced dead in the hospital. And the parents brought her to the church and said, Pastor, please pray for our daughter. And the assistant pastor was like, this is not a hospital, this is not a ward. Please you know, take the body. We don't do these things here. They, they laid the body on the table there in the doctor's office, in the, in the pastor's office. And the pastor just felt led, like, no, I feel like we should pray. So you go out and start the prayer meeting, and we will, uh, I'll pray with the parents. So the assistant pastor went out to start the prayer meeting. This was, again, about, uh, I think, eight hours after she had, uh, after she had died, or at least was thought to be dead. And um, the assistant pastor at the prayer meeting were quite surprised when the pastor walked out with the girl in hand uh, alive. All of, um, five years later, uh, when, I, when I interviewed um, Pastor Andre, she, she still remained well. And my translator stopped and looked at me and he said, I've actually heard this story before because I'm friends with the guy who used to be the assistant pastor and I heard it again. <coughs> but I have a number of accounts from Congo Brazzaville. This is where my wife is from. And all of these are from the Eglise Evangelique de Congo. It's the, the mainline uh, Protestant denomination there. <coughs> uh, the main, yeah, it's the largest Protestant denomination there in Congo. And, uh, Actually, one of the stories we got from the head of the denomination, but all of these, including this one, are from friends of my wife's family. Uh, people my wife knows are from my wife, close to by my wife's family. We, we had a, a number of accounts from Mama Jean. I'm, I'm just going to give you one of her three accounts. But um, one of them was of a baby who was born dead. Mama Jean uh, was a midwife. She'd been trained by the World Health Organization. And this baby was born dead. Um, Mama Jean said she must have died in the night in mother's womb. The baby was already gray when it came out. And the umbilical cord was wrapped around the neck. The father went out to build a coffin. And while he was doing that, Mama Jean prayed uh, with the other people there. There was a Catholic woman and, uh, and then somebody else from the umbilical church of Congo, the mother. And they prayed. And the father comes back in for building the coffin, and the baby's alive. And they named the baby No Bronx, Powerful Grace. She's now in school. Uh, we got a couple of stories from the Viswayswakes. Uh, like like Mama Jean, uh, Papa Viswayswe is a deacon in the Evangelical Church of Congo. Very close friends of my, uh, my wife's family. In fact, Papa Viswayswe is now my brother in law's father in law, which makes him sort of my. Awkward law, something like that. Um, but he was he was doing ministry in Entombe, in the north of Congo, when um, they, when he heard well actually he was a school inspector in the north of Congo, but he was doing ministry inside. And they, they brought him a body of, of a girl who had died about eight hours earlier. And said, Can you can you pray for for this uh, this child. And <clears throat> what had happened, she had blood in her ears, nose, mouth. Um, after she died, they took her to various traditional healers, sacrificed animals, smeared the blood in her orifices. If she wasn't dead before, I'm sure she was dead after they finished. So he said, why did he turn to all these other gods first? He should have turned first to the living and the true God, the God and Father of Jesus Christ. But he said, I'll pray. Took her aside, 
for about half an hour, handed her back to the parents alive. And the village was so excited about this that the next time a child died, they also brought that child to uh, Papa Disgraceer. But he was out of town at that point. Uh, so they got his wife, Julianne, to pray. And <clears throat> she prayed, and that child was raised. And afterwards, she was like, I can't believe I did this. But you know, God gave her the strength she needed at that moment. Well, I, I just wanted to check because I thought, well, maybe you know, if you pray for everybody who dies, once in a while, somebody's not going to be really dead, and they're just going to come back. So I said, do you pray for everybody who dies? And they said, no, these are the only two times we've ever done it. God just wanted to show his power in it to be. Um, and uh, when I asked uh, Leo Bawa, who I mentioned earlier, if he had ever prayed for anybody else, he said once. And the best friend, he wasn't raised. But this time, where the, the gospel was at stake in this village, God uh, did it. Um, and uh, I asked Dr. Crandall, and he said yes. One time, my son had been dying with a team, and he died, and I prayed for him to be raised. And he wasn't raised. But I determined that I wasn't going to abandon faith in God. I was going to keep my faith in God. And when the time came that God led me to go pray for Jeff Martin, I was ready. God doesn't always do it. These are, these are signs of the kingdom. There are four takes of the future. Uh, otherwise, all of us would be walking around with resurrected bodies and wouldn't be able to die anymore. But there were a wonder of God's promise of what he's going to do. But the one that really got my attention was this one from Antoinette Malambe. Um, this was kind of a turning point to me in my own life. I've heard this story before from my wife, but uh, I, I interviewed Antoinette Malambe. And she told me that when uh, one, one of her daughters, her oldest daughter, was two years old, she cried out that she was bitten by a snake. The mother got to her, the child wasn't breathing. She, you know, there was no medical help available in the village, so she strapped the child to her back and ran to a nearby village where her family friend, Coco Mzoma Moise, was being ministered. Coco Moise prayed for the child, she started breathing, the next day she was fine. So I asked Antoinette Malambe, how long was it that she wasn't breathing? And she had to stop the thing to get from this village to that village. She said, about three hours. And that's not as long as eight hours, but this one really impressed me. Um, Therese Magnuka uh, has now finished seminary, and her master's degree. She's now a pastor in, in Congo. And this one really impacted me because Antoinette Malambe is my mother-in-law, and Therese is my sister-in-law. <clears throat> and not to doubt one's mother-in-law, but we did confirm it also with Coco Moise. <laughs> Sarah Spear is a Canadian nurse in Congo, and she also gave us a report of the race. I'm just going to bring on the reports of Nietzsche Miracles. Uh, I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, the water to wine ones were kind of interesting. There was a uh, a researcher, he did in principle believe in miracles, but he didn't believe stuff like this was happening. <clears throat> uh, Kurt Koch, a German researcher, uh, he went uh, at the height of the Indonesian revival, and he actually saw blind eyes open, and he saw water turn to wine. Uh, <clears throat> skip, have any of you heard Watchman Lee? Uh, now, Watchman Lee wasn't as much associated with miracles in China. Really, John Sung is much better known for that. But uh, Watchman Lee, uh, in, in his early days of ministry, he was out in a village uh, with some friends, and they were doing evangelism. Nobody was listening to them. And people were saying, why should we believe in your God? Look, our God is so powerful that for yeah, 265 years, something like that, it has never rained the day that the priest scheduled its festival. Maybe it was rye season or something. But in any case, never rain on the day of this, this festival. So our God is more powerful. <clears throat> well, one of, the, one of the Christians said, this year it's going to rain on the day. So they just laughed and walked off. And he, <clears throat> he went back and told the others, and he said, you shouldn't have done that. Because if it doesn't rain on that day, nobody's going to listen to it. But then again, nobody to listen to it anyway. So they began to pray. And on the, on the scheduled day of the festival, 
or down the rain. The priest said, oh, we made a mistake. And they rescheduled the festival. <laughs> well, this time the Christians went out and they said, the day that you rescheduled it for, it's going to rain on that day too. And that day, it poured down, it was the most rain that they had in years. And it poured down so hard that the priests who were carrying the statue were swept off the feet. The statue was broken. And large numbers of people came to Christ in that, in that village. Emmanuel Thompson, uh, born and raised in Nigeria, uh, now, uh, well, he was, he was my colleague in the Hebrew Bible at uh, Palmer Seminary where I taught. He was uh, uh, at the Hebrew Union College. <coughs> he shared with me that when he was a boy, his father was doing evangelism in an unevangelized part of Nigeria. And he'd come to one village, and in that village, uh, it, it was clearly rainy season was about to start. He had just moved there. He was, he was getting a home ready, but they didn't have a roof on the home yet. And people were mocking him, saying, everything you have is going to be destroyed. Uh, the rains are coming. And he got mad. He said, it's not going to rain one drop of rain in this village until I have the roof on my house. And they laughed at him and left. It's going to take four more days to get He fell on his face before God. He said, Oh God, what have I done? just done? But for the next four days, it poured down rain all around the village. But not a single drop of rain fell within the village. And so at the end of those four days, the people who knew what rainy season was supposed to look like in that village, there was only one person at the end of those four days who had not become Christian. And they still speak of it in that village as the uh, the, the precipitating event <laughs> that made them a Christian village. Now, of course, perhaps, perhaps this rain was merely psychosomatic. So, <clears throat> scholars, by, by the way, there, there is such a thing as psychosomatic recovery. But, um, but I've tried to give you examples that probably don't fit in that category. Scholars have claimed that eyewitnesses could not report experiences such as these simply reveal their own very limited exposure to the world. With some grant that these things happen, but deny that they knew the so Part of that goes back, to, the main argument for this goes back to David Hume, um, who had actually two arguments. One was that miracles are violations of natural law based on the conception of natural law that isn't really what we normally use today. Um, and I won't go into this in, in too much detail for the sake of time. But this other argument, it was supposedly inducted, but actually it was circular. He said that uniform human experience shows us that we, we can't really believe miracle accounts. Uh, we, don't, we don't have well-supported eyewitness testimony for miracles. Uh, and if we do get eyewitness testimony, we, we can reject them because it is uniform human experience. Uh, you see the circularity in that argument. For example, uh, Blaise Pascal. Have any of you heard of Blaise Pascal? Uh, he's often considered the father of modern computer. Have any of you heard of computers? <laughs> so, uh, Pascal's niece had a running eye sore. She committed a foul odor, and <clears throat> it was <clears throat> medically documented. Everything was, all the evidence was there. She was instantly and publicly healed in Jansen's monastery. The Queen Mother of France sent her own physician to check this out and confirms it. So um, Hume mentions this and he says, well, look, this was medically documented. This was public. This meets all of my criteria for what we would need for evidence for a miracle. And we know this didn't happen, so why would we believe any other evidence? This is his argument. It's a great argument, right? Part of being circular. And there have been a number of major uh, recent philosophic challenges to being published by Cambridge, Oxford, and so on. But the Oxford one, of course, was that this one was criticized uh, because it has this strong title, Hume's Abject Failure, this argument about miracles. And somebody somebody critiqued the, the author's book. They said, You just wrote this because you're a Christian. To which the author responded, Actually, I'm not a Christian. I just thought it was a bad one. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Hume also said that, that only ignorant and barbarous nations have heard miracles. And we know Hume was a racist. Uh, his arguments supporting slavery were used a long time after him. He said that there were no intelligent black people in the world. 
uh, or people from other races except white people. He was only intelligent people. He knew of you know, everybody knew about this one this one black man who composed poetry in English and in Latin, but he knew just compared him to a parrot uh, who could, could repeat whatever he heard, uh, which was quite inaccurate. Probably the guy anyway, the guy is well known, Francis Williams was actually a pretty good poet. But in any case, <clears throat> Rudolf Bookman says mature modern people don't believe in miracles. Uh, if you use the electric light and the telegraph, well, then you can't believe in the New Testament world. <clears throat> um, he excludes from the modern world thereby all Orthodox Jews, Christians, Muslims, traditional tribal religions, spiritists, basically everybody except this mid 20th century academic Eurocentric elite. <clears throat> I pointed this out to one of the professors who was the school's last remaining book on him. Um, and uh, he said, Bokman had his presuppositions. Well, you have your presuppositions too. I said, that's true. Well, he's a good atheist. I don't believe miracles can happen. Um, now I'm a Christian. I believe they can happen. But let's take a, what we call a neutral starting point and say maybe they happen, maybe they don't. Let's look at the evidence. So I started listening and instantaneous his healings and answered their believing prayer that I had experienced or witnessed. And then after I concluded, I said, now your next logical step is to be challenged my credibility as my witness. But he changed the subject. And, and two thirds of the graduate students sitting on the table, they were like, yes. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Yusuf Gonzalez, citing Latino churches, says that what Bokhman declares to be impossible is not just possible, but even frequent. Hua Young, who recently retired as the Methodist bishop from Malaysia, says Bokhman's issue is a Western issue. This is not something we, we deal with in Asia. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, reports from other parts of the world as well. How widespread are healing claims? And here I'm just rapidly surveying because I can easily answer questions. But um, there have been major academic studies on this published by Oxford and others. Um, starting, so, yeah, yeah, uh, no, Harvey Cox was the author, but he wrote the introduction, a book of the Global Pentecostal and Charismatic Healing published by Oxford. Now, they, the, um, I'm just starting by looking at churches that have been known for that emphasis. Spirit and Power was a, a 2006 Pew Forum survey of Pentecostals and Charismatics in 10 countries. And if you look at the, at the survey results, if you add up the figures, what you have is somewhere around 200 million Pentecostals and Charismatics in these 10 countries alone claim to have witnessed divine healing. More surprising is that they also surveyed the other Christians in these countries. And about 39% of Christians who don't claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic in these countries also claim to have witnessed their experience of healing. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. Um, even in the US, you know, it, it's estimated about 34%. But this is not just Christians, so this is not all what we would say is healing in the name of Jesus. But it's a lot of people. Now, nobody would say that all of these are actual miracles. Uh, nobody would say all of these are actual divine healing. But the, the point here is not what proportion of these claims involve divine activity. The point is whether you can legitimately uh, rule out miracles on the basis of uniform human experience that they don't happen. when we've got hundreds of millions of claims to have witnessed them happen. And this isn't just people starting with Christian premises. Millions of non-Christians have been convinced. And in many places, people have changed centuries of ancestral beliefs based on extraordinary healings. This wasn't just like, oh, my toe hurt a minute ago, and now it doesn't hurt. Um, this was something so dramatic that they were willing to do something that wasn't even considered socially acceptable in their society. Um, in China, for example, one source from within the Three South Church, um, somewhere around the year 2000, said that in the previous 20 years, about 50% of all conversions have been due to both faith healing experiences. An estimate from within the rural house churches gave it as close to 90%. Now, I can't tell you what percentage actually exactly it would have been, but we're probably talking about millions of people who changed ancestral beliefs and became followers of Jesus. You have this often in India as well. In a 1981 study, 10% of non-Christians in the drops, non-Christians, um, 
claimed that they had been healed or somebody praying for them in the name of Jesus. Pastor Israel was one of my seminarians from India. And through prayer for the sick, his Baptist church moved from Pentecostal <coughs> to about 600 people, most of the converts of Hinduism. Uh, I found out about this actually by accident because in the room where this picture was taken, I, I came in one night and he was, he was sitting there and he asked me how I was doing. He said, oh, splitting headache. He said, oh, brother, let me pray for you. And he prayed for me. He said, how, how do you feel now? He said, still have a splitting headache. Uh, it's because I don't have any things. He said, no, it's, brother, it doesn't work here. Everybody I pray for in India gets healed. But, but I pray for people here and they don't get healed. And he said, it's because God is just reaching out to these precious Hindu people who, who don't know about his love of Jesus and just lavishing his love upon them so that they can know about his son Jesus. Um, my, by the way, my headache did eventually go away. J.P. Moreland says that of the rapid evangelical growth in the past few decades, up to 70% of it is intimately connected with signs and wonders. <clears throat> Not exclusively, but most often. It, it happens here. I mean, I've given some examples from here as well. Uh, and actually, we may be groundbreaking evangelism in this country pretty soon, too. In some places, we already do. Um, but it happens most often in groundbreaking evangelism in relatively new areas. Um, if God, when the, when the Bible talks about gifts of healings, or in James chapter, chapter 5, praying, prayer of faith for the sick. It doesn't say how the person has to be healed. It can be gradual. If it's through medical needs, it's, it's still God's gift. It's still an answer to prayer. But signs are things that are meant to grip your attention. And those happen, not exclusively again, but especially in areas where the gospel is breaking new ground. Um, one, one report I, I got from one of my students at Asbury from India, and I know I need to wrap this up. Uh, but but, but one, of my, one of my students from India um, he worked with a, a man in North India named uh, Bari Malto. Bari Malto had been a shaman, but he also had leprosy. And, and because of his leprosy, he was expelled from his village. Well, two Pentecostal women came and prayed for him, and, uh, and then went on. <clears throat> that night, in a dream, an angel touched him, and he woke he was completely healed of leprosy. He went into his village, the entire village was converted. Over the next few years, through signs and wonders, 50% of the region was converted. And uh, when my student was there, he said, <clears throat> miracles eventually, the visible miracles eventually died down. Because what was needed now in this phase of the church was teaching. But in starting it off, you have these, these massive visible miracles. So if you, want to, if you want to really see some cool visible miracles, evangelize. <laughs> go, go, go to people who need the gospel, because God wants to reach those people. But God, God hears it for us anyway. Anyway, this, this has also been something in the past. I'm just going to give a couple examples. Many church fathers claim to be eyewitnesses of healings and exorcisms. Um, that was the leading cause of conversion in the third and fourth centuries. So that's the verdict of Ramsey of Mullen. The old historian. <clears throat> it was also a common feature of the Korean revival in the early 1900s, mainly among Presbyterians. So it's, it happens in all sorts of different circles. But uh, I think I should stop there and open it up to questions. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
don't believe they can, so they don't even try to pray for them. Yeah. Because a lot of people don't think that they think that's something that's past or stuff, so they don't even bother to try. <clears throat> Yeah, <clears throat> there, there are really, I think, multiple reasons why we don't see it as often here. One is, like some of my friends from Africa say, look, life in Africa is unethical. We have to have miracles. Um, but, you know, in your country, they say, the system works. Medical care works. That's good. Don't complain about it. Give thanks for what you have. So um, that's, that's probably one factor. I mean, Mothers dying in childbirth happens a lot more in Africa than it happens here. So that even though you do have miracles, they don't happen all the time. And miracles are not the, uh, a cure-all for everything out in this age. But they do show us what God cares about, so we know that we need to take care of this, be health and uh, feeding people and so on. But also, what you said, <coughs> Western culture has been very much influenced by human supernaturalism and it's kind of a bias with which we approach things. Um, there was a survey that was done of doctors in the US and a majority of them said that they had witnessed miracles. So um, <clears throat> and that's pretty good taking into account the fact that some some doctors don't believe in miracles but um, but a majority of doctors said that they had seen miracles. But having having said that I think sometimes it's because of our, our view of faith also. Like I said in the sound of the sometimes we think we don't have enough faith and we have the wrong conception of faith because faith is just depending on God's faithfulness. God is the one who does the miracles, not us. He's the one who gets the credit. And so um, I think there are a variety of factors, but one is our world view. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Bobby. Um, so why do when people pray, um, why sometimes it's just one command, they get healed, but we pray for 30 minutes and they be time to get healed. <clears throat> that would be really good to write a book on labor from the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to say. 
I didn't know what I was supposed to do. You know, I've just started fumbling around in prayer, and all of a sudden he starts screaming, I'm going to heal, I'm going to heal. And I'm like, wait, God, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> and then all the time, nothing happens to me. So um, God is, is sovereign. Uh, that doesn't answer the theological details, but uh, you're the theologian, you have to answer. Well, Bobby is in my Holy Spirit class, and he should know the answer to that. We were talking about this. You know, but the kingdom of God is already and not yet, which means some do get healed now as signs of what's coming. But the kingdom's not fully present, so not everyone gets healed. And healings are not about living forever anyway. It's a sign of what we'll all receive one day. And it is a mystery, as Craig said, why some and not others. But even when you look at Jesus, Mark 1, he healed many, not all. He prays twice for a blind man. Why didn't it work the first time? You'll find that Paul left three people sick. It didn't always work. You find, you know, so Elijah you have this Elijah idea of sickness. Elijah died of sickness, and yes. yet he was so full of the power of God that when he threw corpse and without the bones, the corpse came back to life. Yeah. yeah. And actually in James 5 it says if you have the faith like Elijah, the faith of the righteous person will see healing. If you go back and read this in James, what? You're the Bible guy. So Chad was that Elijah story. He, he well, prays for the rain. Of course of seven, the the yeah. prayer for rain would probably be chapter 18 or 19. I'll say 17, 18, 19. Somewhere in there. Okay. <laughs> so what happens is you go back and read that. And that's what James said. Pray like this guy. Fire is in chapter 8. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, go, so you, you go and read that story. And he actually prays seven times. And he keeps sending the servant. Go see if rain clouds are coming. Yeah. Go see if rain. I think it's 18. Because okay. He's <laughs> stuck on the thing. I'm still telling the story. <laughs> Somewhere in the Bible. Right? <laughs> it's true. The seventh time he comes back and says, I do see a dark cloud on the horizon. That's seventh time. So if it takes Jesus a couple times and the apostles try to cast out a demon from a, a boy and said we couldn't do it. You know? And Jesus said, Yeah, did you guys think about praying? And like, no. No. <laughs> Oh, okay. That explains that. So, uh, so even in the Bible, not everything is instantaneous or everyone is always healed every single time. Even in the scripture. Yeah. I, I could have given, yeah, I can give, yeah, I, know, I know a bunch of the examples, but just in the Gospels and Acts. He's in Gospels and Acts. He doesn't know all of No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Second Timothy 4, Trophimus, I would have been sick. And yeah. Philippians chapter 2, Epiphanitis. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah. Yeah. well, how are we pronounced? Yeah. <laughs> You're the Greek guy. <laughs> but anyway, another question. We've got a sidetrack there. <laughs> Questions about healing or stories? Now, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question. How many of you know someone that you think was healed or you Definitely saw a miracle. Just stick your hand in. Well, that's uh, about a third, maybe a quarter to a third. So, so you know, if you have testimony, in, in that way, it's really hard to verify a miracle, right? How are you going to verify it? Well, all you can say is like what Craig has been saying here. Someone's diagnosed. We have a record, right? People say he's dead or will never get well or they have cancer and then a bunch of Christians come in, they pray, and all we have is a report they're well. You still can't, you know, was it psychos, man, whatever, but cumulative evidence from all around the world by millions of people ought to penetrate Western skepticism a tiny bit. I, I made, um, I thought about this in terms of the cumulative strength of it because like it, it might in my immediate circle there were ten cases of, of eyewitness accounts of people being raised from the dead. <clears throat> if you if you assume that, that like there's like one chance in ten that you you know 
just on average, if you're not assuming too many people would be buried prematurely, maybe one chance of 10 that an average person would know, you know, somebody who had a report like this. But then it gets compounded, the improbability, every time that you have um, another one of them. So for me to have 10 in my circle, I think the odds are like 1 in 10 billion, something like that. And then I have to be the one to write the book. So I really think explaining it as coincidence is kind of going up on a far-fetched limb. But people are free to do that. Any last question? Anyone? All right, let's give Craig that.